Hello everybody, um, lovely to see you here. So data in databases, and I just put on this title, it's not what you think, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. Um, I wasn't able to be here this morning, but listening to talks this afternoon, people are talking about um, uh, what I would call blobs, binary large objects, uh, large unstructured objects. When you get into data, it's a different picture. And Claire and I have been sharing our different kinds of expertise to uh, explain some of the key ideas here. So um, we'll start off with our point, uh, which is that the long-term preservation of data makes you, requires you to understand how data is created and managed. You have to know what's going on in a database. We have to work out what data the business needs to keep, and by the business I mean the business of the day, um, the business that is running processes and generating the data, and what records the business needs to create and keep. That's a different matter. And how we can make sure that data can be unchanged and what we also mean by usable and retrievable. In the back of my mind is the script of the New Archive New Zealand Create and Maintain standard for records, and it doesn't exactly apply here, but we'll go on. So this is the kind of thing we're going to cover. The problem, just talked about that. What is a record and its attributes? Databases, data sets, Data warehouses, Claire has a great deal of expertise in data warehousing and data marts, and how we can ensure, ensure that useful data sets are available over time. So our agenda is the problem, definitions, delivering data and records from data. So we're talking about some key concepts around data warehousing and data life cycle management and our conclusion. So here's the problem from a traditional records perspective. Is it a problem? Well, it's the issue. Um, that we used to have semi-structured records. If you think about the births, deaths and marriages register, and of course, yes, we do register divorces, um, that um, it used to be a big ledger in a book and you could turn the pages and it was a physical object. Yes, you could scan it, but it was still, it was structured, but it was on pieces of paper. Now we've got things like the um, Earthquake Claims Commission in New Zealand running this huge project, Claims Data. A lot of it will be in a database. But we want some of that long-term usable format. Records managers, we, me, me including me, uh, not so familiar with the world of structured data, don't really understand. So f here's something that, that really triggered it for me was I saw a disposal outcome in a draft authority saying, when the database is decommissioned, transfer it to Archives New Zealand. And I was thinking, what? Can't do that. Transfer what? So, um, and just because the thing's finished doesn't make it a, like a blob. So let's move on and find out some more. So what have we got? We've got data and databases. This is the kind of thing that we can slice and dice and do transformations on. This is the kind of thing that business users want. What do, we, what do record keepers want? Records. So we're gonna to need to maintain some metadata. There's a much broader audience. And we're not actually too sure about what it is in the database that we want to preserve. So we want to preserve for something, not quite sure yet what, for the long term. And so what's a record? And in the context of data, what on earth is a record? Is it an individual data item? Is it a whole data set? This is the kind of thing that we need to be familiar with. So we've got customers. We've got two different kinds of customers. Customers for data, customers for records. So for example, a New Zealand government agency has customers, it got internal customers for its data, but for the minutes, so for the, for the if we're going to transfer something to an archival authority, then there's a completely set of diff different set of customers. We've got uh, information assets, maybe a broader term to use. So we've got individual records, there's transactional data in databases, data sets, meaning something that's combined up, data marts and data warehouses, which Claire will go into a little bit. What do we have to do? So we're gonna look at some principles from data warehousing, because there is a whole lot of work being done in that space, initially for different reasons, but useful for us. And data lifecycle management. So some definitions. The, Re the Public Records Act of 2005 has this definition of a record. Any form, whole or part, created or received. If you look in the structured world, what does a record mean? It's a line of data in a table 
in a database. Now, there's not much in common between those two, a huge difference. So, attributes of a record from a record-keeping perspective. By the way, um, this guy, he's uh, in New Orleans, and he is carrying out of his house his vital records above his head. So, um, record-keeping perspective documents the carrying out of the business objectives, functions, and services, and so on. Evidence of compliance documents the value of things uh, and how risks are managed, supports the long-term viability of the organisation. From a data management perspective, we're talking about field types. We've got numeric, character, date and time kinds of fields. Composite, meaning that we might combine data from different places to create a set of data. And derived, meaning that we might do something like a calculation. So date of birth, current date, therefore age. That's the kind of thing that we mean by derived. And then the values that are actually sitting in the data. So um, Adam Brown, Adam here? No, nope. from Statistics New Zealand. But he was writing about um, wanting to broaden the scope of the um, core standard ISO 15489 that record keepers use. And he said this, there's a different relationship between data and its metadata and documents in their metadata. And we'll go into it later a little bit more. Is it data or is it metadata? All about the layer. So if you're looking in a data table, so for example in here, here's a date, date created, it's just data. But if you're talking about the date a document was created, or the date maybe that a database was created, or some other object that we describe from the outside, then that's metadata. Any, over to Claire. Now, in the interest of public health and safety, I feel I should say that this presentation does come with a warning. That Trish is from the unstructured data world, I am from the structured data world. So whereas she thinks in pictures, I definitely think in lists. So we haven't actually come to blows over this presentation, but can't guarantee that won't happen. So metadata within the data warehouse environment, I expect to see two types of metadata. On the one hand, you've got business users, they want something at a higher level that's going to tell them, you know, like a A to Z of London, a roadmap for access. Whereas your technical users, what have we got? How did it get there? How do I maintain it, update it, and all the rest? Wrong button. Oh, yep, no, there we go. And so business metadata users, they're wanting, you know, what's the table, what's the field, how can I use it, what's it mean, how, what's the summarisation, what's the business rule, how do I interpret it and, pr and produce something else with it. Whereas technical metadata, you're looking at, you know, your tables, indexes, job dependencies, uh, execution, audit, security, that sort of thing. Used to be, we said we had, you know, one byte of megabyte amount, sorry, one byte of metadata for 10 bytes of data, but now really it's, the situation has reversed. This is data. It's just not very useful unless you've got some way of interpreting. How do I read that file without a header to tell me how to pick out a name? If I've got a name, James, is it a first name, is it a second name, is he a customer, is he a supplier, what is he? So you need to be able to read and interpret that data in order to get it into a nice neat table. There's my record, a row in a table or a data set. Now that's nice and neat, it's got names that you can tell what they are, but you might have a, data, a table called T1 and every field is called F1, F2, etc. Now that table or data set may be part of a larger database and within that database you have your relationships, your keys, how to link those tables. And if that database is then part of one of your standard source system applications that run your business, then you're going to have as well as that database layer of data, you're going to have all the application that's th that makes it work as a system and then you have your user layer or uh, uh, for access on top of that. So this is a diagram that I drew, which said data layer and application layer. And you can see that uh, the application layer is doing a huge amount of work. It's manipulating what's in there. It can be um, deleting what's in there. And it provides those views and reports that we think of or that the user thinks of as the data. But down the bottom, it's just the, the data and tables being acted on. 
And that's why you can't transfer a database, because unless you can move the application layer over as well, then you just get back down to those data and tables. Can data fit the definition of a record in the Public Records Act? Well, we say we are format neutral in the management of records, so we need to just um, harden up here and get on with it. Uh, data can be records, because if you, for example, lost, if you excluded the births, deaths and marriages data, and the EQC claims data, think about what you would lose. You would lose a huge amount of um, important information. And what is the impact in the future of not being able to access that information? So we have to get in there, roll up our sleeves and get hold of what we need. So a source solution, that is to say a transactional database, is not a record keeping system because it holds transactional data, not in context, it isn't tamper-proof. It's really hard to know actually what's going on down in that bottom layer, what, what the application layer is doing to the data layer. And things may be arranged differently. It's hard to roll back to a point in time, often in, the, in these databases. Maybe not in the financial ones, but in many others. Uh, a database, a transactional database, has to do a lot, many, many quick transactions. And to do that, it overwrites and removes redundant data. So there is no sense of keeping what was. If it's not needed, it can go. A compromise of history versus speed, and it's the business that will win every time on that one. And you can't use that data layer without the application layer. So everything is ephemeral, here today, gone tomorrow. So an activity about a customer is a record. Was there a unique ID for the transaction or for the customer? Where are the pieces? We're looking for table names and column names, and standard names for elements across tables would be nice, but not always, and certainly not between databases. So here's my list. So you can see a source system or a transactional system, lots of very quick transactions uh, with lots of users on that system. That's the nature of those, those systems. And try as I might, I mean, if I'm lucky, I'll get people when they're building those systems to build in the feed to a data warehouse. That system is not designed for the kind of activity that you're going to do on a data warehouse. And certainly as a data warehouse person, I would have no input or minimal input into what the design of these source systems might look like. So here's our data warehouse. And well, what have we got here? In terms of a definition, used for storing and accessing large amounts of data, it has an enterprise-wide approach with all your core systems. Well, that's what it should have. Having said that, there's a lot of things out there that are called data warehouses that may or may not actually be one. But by and large, we can say it's an enterprise-wide affair. It's a corporately, you know, corporate effort. There's transaction-level data, a full history. So everything that's happened into that source system that quite possibly be, has, has been overwritten is in fact recorded through time in a data warehouse, or should be. Lots of data from multiple source systems, and it's designed specifically for that reporting and analysis kind of activity. So whereas a source system, lots of very quick short transactions, in a warehouse, you're joining two tables of several hundred million rows each, that takes quite a lot of processing. So unpredictable, and resource intensive kind of activity within a data warehouse environment, and that's what they're designed to cope with. So what we were interested in was, what's the simplest and most robust, uh, almost unbreakable approach to getting data and records out of databases? Because remember, we have two different audiences. We have some people who are interested in data long-term, and some people who are interested in more summary record type material long-term. Um, I uh, took this photo because I was intrigued by the solution. This is Singapore, where space is at a premium. They needed a gondola, and they needed a building in the same place, not a problem. You put a hole through the building, it's all good. Yes? So let's think about, first off, create a policy to work out what it is that we actually want to retain, what authoritative stuff we want to retain, what do we want to know long term from all this data? And what metadata we have to retain about it? What formats are acceptable? And how simple can we make them? What's transient? 
Because if we know what's transient, then we can, like, we can get rid of duplicates really quickly. We can build ourselves permission to do so and we can document that we're doing it. Because that way we can say, this is what they do and it's fine, it's all transient, not a problem. That's back in those transactional databases, those source solutions. So the idea then is you can't trust the transactional database. Who knows what it's doing overnight? Uh, so let's get in there and get the stuff we want out. And that's where, for example, that's exactly the principle that data warehouses work on. Identify what data tables, what records we need, and what we can produce. Map them across to disposal authorities. That can be straightforward. Um, and what you need to know behind, beyond your system decommission. A little bit more about that later. And identify what the business need is. Remember, there's two customers here. There is the business need for retention, just with the business's data, and there's also the long-term need. So we're using, while we've got an application layer sitting above those data tables, use it to create and export. Then store it in a record-keeping system. It doesn't matter which one, so long as it meets the criteria. A data warehouse, it could be an EDRMS, could be both for a while. And then keep what we need for the business after the database is decommissioned. I don't know about you, but I've got this experience of, of the quick, we're going to decommission the database, what do we need? And that's just about three or four years too late in the process. We, need, we should have a decommission strategy before. Um, persistently associating metadata is a key aspect of record keeping and knowing the linkages or we should consolidate everything into one system and make sure it's persistently associated. Very hard to maintain links between items that are in different repositories, for example. It may be easier just to pull it out and consolidate it. And we ensure that migrated objects keep their context. And we don't do what we have seen in EDRMS is where you migrate documents and the author becomes the name of the administrator who moved them and the date they created becomes the date the administrator migrated them. We love that. Um, so this is a diagram that shows that, for example, the customer management system and a case management system could be busy hurling data into a data warehouse. And they could also be putting information into the, an EDRMS, a document management system, right? A document and records management system. But then again, also, you can put it where you want it. So for example, you could export records from a data warehouse into an EDRMS or some other system that will hold and, um, and your records to a record keeping standard. Our data warehouse is a large, <coughs> complex computer system. So you can see that there are multiple source systems feeding into that data warehouse in order to produce information in a variety of different ways. If we drill down a little bit, you'll see that within the data warehouse, you have data stored at different levels. So it'll come in level one, a full transaction of everything that's happened to everybody across every change in all those source systems. And this might be, you look at Ministry of Social Development, they have 35 source systems, I think they're up to feeding into their data warehouse environment. So they, they are large and they are complex. So you have a lot of kind of data management activity you must have going on within a data warehouse environment. Level one, detailed transaction history. Higher levels of data you might have for easier, simpler access for different types of users. If I'm feeding data into a data warehouse, into that level one, then I'm going to follow certain data feed principles to make sure that data comes across right. So I don't want to see any black boxes. I want to know exactly what's happening. I want a full audit trail of how it got there. And if I'm going to be really thorough, I'm going to verify my level one history back against the source system. Assuming I've got enough resources to do that sort of thing. Um, at the level one, you've got a lot of processing that goes on. For, now, this is just one table out of one system and one data warehouse where you're, you're taking a history of 29 months of data and you're actually processing it so that you get rid of all duplicate data. And there you can see in that case, you started with 88 gigabytes, you ended up with six gigabytes. So you haven't lost anything, you've only got rid of duplicates, but you've retained all meaningful changes in that data. So a lot of processing to achieve a level one history. 
higher levels of data. It might be a subset, a snapshot maybe of data as at a point of time. We use this stuff a lot. Let's have it there ready for people to use. Might be a data mart, uh, which has a more business focus as opposed to a data warehouse with an enterprise approach. Might be a summary layer of data. So they are higher layers of data. They're quicker. They're easier to access. And the benefits of the data warehouse are many accessible. All that data is stored online, quick and easy to access, or it should be, multiple sources of data. At least I would expect it to be updated daily with a full history. It's an analytical playground. So it gives room for analysts to explore and discover things in the data. And the environment is tuned for that sort of activity. I hate that one version of the truth. But that's what it's supposed to be, and we hope it is with the right metadata and business rules. Data is messy, unruly, unmanageable stuff. We all know that. It doesn't manage itself. For a warehouse environment of this kind, you're going to have standards and processes. You're going to have a team, a multi-skilled team with a variety of different skill sets. And to me, anybody leading an environment like that has got to be a pretty good communicator at all levels of the organisation and outside, and a good marketer as well. Data warehousing, it's been around for a while. I think you can say it's a kind of proven technology. I'd have to question, um, will it, I think it'll be around for some time yet. Whether it will see us going further in the future, I have my doubts. I think that you know the demand, the volume, the demand for information now, it's warehouses, traditional warehouses are going to struggle to keep up with that sort of demand. But until technology improves in a variety of ways, then a data warehouse is a vital part of an organisation's information infrastructure. I couldn't resist. This is a slide. I pinched it out of the um, Gartner recent information management conference. And it's about symptoms of data management illness. Um, you don't have to go too far to come across some of those uh, symptoms, really. Um, data management's not a very sort of sexy topic in IT, but it's good fun as far as I'm concerned. Uh, another one from um, Gartner, again, everybody's talking big data and people tend to think, oh, volume, you know, a lot of this stuff. But it's not just about volume, it's velocity as well. If you think about, you know, smart uh, meters that are going in, which are sending data all the time, you know, you're getting a huge explosion, so it's the speed of that stuff coming in. You're getting organisations getting so much data that they must process it on the fly. They cannot physically store that amount of data. So these are all, and the complexity, the different formats that, that we're getting data in. So there are huge challenges, and these challenges are now coming into my structured world where we're taking more unstructured data into the data warehouse environment and, and recognising that all the other kind of data is a vital part of the overview of the information of an organisation. The um, market statement down below, again, that's a Gartner statement about um, data doubling and needing to determine your strategy. Just another point, too, about information strategies. Often I see information strategies being written in an organisation either by somebody with a records management background or by somebody with a business intelligence or data warehousing background. So to me, an information strategy should be about managing the whole lot. The other challenge that I see is about this need to work together, and we tend to think of IT and business, but also I look at quite a few organisations where they'll have under one manager, they might have business intelligence, data warehousing, records, library, so they're all there under one manager, but they're all completely working in separate um, silos of their own, so I do see this need for a structured and unstructured um, data management to be coming together. Okay, so um, just looking at the time, we'll box on. I've uh, talked a little bit about decommissioning. The transition from one system to another is the, always the greatest risk to the information that was uh, in that system. And um, you often get partial exports and you also lose um, the, or the authoritativeness or you, um, you, you damage, lose some of the context as you move it over. So that was just pointing that out. Um, data lifecycle management is about managing it, managing data and metadata across systems and repositories right through to when it can be discarded. 
And it talks about that the business value is not necessarily about age or how often it's used. We need to understand business value better. Um, so data and information has different kinds of value, strategic and operational, managing risk, beating legislative obligations. And the value of much information decays over time, but not all. Some can be archived, some discarded, we need to know which. And also, just that point at the bottom, kind of quirky but rather nice, that just the thing you, didn't think you thought you didn't need, you might need, and you don't know quite when you're going to need it, but you might need it fast. Uh, here's some components, just a, the, sort of a, a classic kind of cycle going on here, create, modify, maintain, use, retain or dispose. Notice the point up there in, that the first part includes data validation. So there's just a whole thing here about what is required, about knowing your artefacts, knowing your risks, making sure that you've got um, the right tools in place to know you've got a single source of the truth, you've got your storage under control, you've got planning for disposal, and then that you actually can dispose of stuff or move it to storage or whatever you're going to do, but in a managed way. So in conclusion, um, I thought I'd go back to the Archives New Zealand Create and Maintain standard and its principles and give them a run past this one. So the principle one is high level and doesn't really need to be applied to an individual system. It's more about the organisation. Does it have policies and procedures? So, well, yes, you can do that at a high level, OK? Probably, you'll probably feel quite comforted at that point. However, moving into principle two, and so we just sort of did up a bit of a chart here. If you've got a database, are the functions and business activities identified and documented well? Probably. In a data warehouse? Maybe. Depends on what you're doing. Um, are the records of, are, are they being created in a database? Possibly. Data warehouse gets a sort of a 50-50 on that one. Um, are all the records being created routinely? Not into a database. Possibly into a, a data warehouse. And is training provided? Well, sure, it could be. Not a technical issue. Looking in this, the picture becomes a little clearer for principle three. You can see that the database is not performing that well. You can get some accurate and authentic stuff in there, but it's the data warehouse or that kind of um, groomed system where inf information is transferred in and there's no change going on to it and it's looked after and it's well described, so it gets the ticks and the boxes and the same thing happens for principle four. And the only thing that happens down the bottom really is that data warehouses traditionally do not apply disposal. They keep everything because of that odd quirky chance that we talked about where people might want stuff occasionally, some specific information, so it's there because you never know. So, talking about the record, keeper, record keeping capability of systems, we're interested in, can we assess them? Are they capable of record keeping? Because if they're not, we have to make them capable or we have to move records out. And for a transactional database, a source system, basically we are talking about moving them out. Get them out, herd them up, move them on. Um, who makes that decision? Well, it's the business owner in conjunction with IT and the records keepers. And the data warehouse shows us what can be done and how to do it. So we're not trying to say put everything in a data warehouse. We are saying they show you how it's a good model of practice um, of principle-based management of information. This is just a slide that we thought we'd show you because we um, know where has built up a, an enterprise information management framework and its governance and information asset architecture and business intelligence and structured and unstructured information and metadata and security and things like this going on in there. Future state of data is what we want, trustworthy, where it's needed, in the format that is most appropriate, formats, sorry, plural, appropriate to business need and the future, and they might mean two different things. You can find information fast, whether it's old or new, you've got clear guidelines, and data has recognisable value and appropriate levels of management. And I think that's not what we're doing. We're just not seeing that very much. Databases do what they do, but the record keepers should be assessing them and the business should be assessing the longer term needs. So our point, again, long term preservation requires understanding of how data is created and managed. We have to work out what 
we need to keep for business reasons and what we need to keep for a longer term um, perspective and how. How can we can make it unchangeable and how can we make it usable and retrievable? And I do have to say that when I first showed Claire that, her first reaction was unprintable, so I won't repeat it here. But that's us. Thank you.